intro. Hello, welcome back to Café Rollist. I am back online. I'm back among the uh, somewhat living. My voice is still broken from my route with COVID, but hopefully my guest will be uh, talking a lot, so I won't have to use my voice too much today. Uh, Lowell, welcome uh, on Café Rollist. Could you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Lowell Francis, and I'm the community manager for the Gauntlet Gaming Calendar. I'm also the author of Asia Ravens, which is a long-running blog, which won an Emmy a, a few years ago. And I'm also the designer and co-writer for uh, Hearts of Wulin. Excellent. Uh, our last game was set in uh, in Wuxia, but it was not uh, Hearts of Wulin. It's nice. You still get... Give a shot to other type of system trying to embrace the same sort of setting. Yeah, this the Osprey book is is interesting. After Lloyd Gahn uh, ran that for us, I, I I picked it up. It's it's got a lot of of neat material in it, and I've tried to collect all of the Wuxia RPGs that people have put out over the years. Uh, uh, Tian Sha, uh, Chin. Uh, weapons of the gods, all of that, because there's lots of really interesting stuff in there. People have have different takes on it. Yeah, I actually have a Wuxia, a French Wuxia game, which has not been the subject of a translation yet, which is just called oh, really? Wulin. Uh, people can hear me buying it on one of our episodes. I bought it when I visited a store in France and uh, asked the the shopkeeper to run a few pitches for games and he was way too efficient and I ended up coming back with uh, <laughs> uh, several games, many of which I still need to to run. Uh, it's I think it's the beauty nowadays of tabletop RPG. Even if you're looking for something quite specific, you can find a lot of different takes which fits different tastes. It's really exciting times, I find. Yeah, well, I was there's a certain amount of democratization with the ability of people to to get access to tabletop publishing materials and also have you know drive through rpg is great but it's, there's a little bit of a barrier there but now with itch.io we've got a lot more people able to produce interesting things and and stuff that i would never have thought of yeah and it, it's the, there also it's where it's nice to have several things which caters to different needs i'm about to publish something on itch and not on drive through because i was advised that itch was much more open minded to works in progress so that's something i'm discovering how designers don't only publish games there but they publish their work in progress and people can support them can play test can give their opinion on what is going on uh, it's uh it's quite exciting as a tool. Yeah, I, and I'm glad to see people being uh, really clear about this is a work that's in progress. This is something we're developing. Um, like uh, I picked up uh, Karandan, uh, Make God Bleed, which is uh, a Filipino sort of high fantasy exalted game. And over the year that I've had it, the designer has worked and reworked it and it's it's beautiful now like like they have have built it up into a really solid game it's it's be lovely they've added art over time they've refined the mechanics and then and not just like tweaked things like the last version they did was they really went back to the skill system and some of the other major mechanical elements and 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 did a whole nother take on it and it's wild to see that to, to see those kinds of jumps being done by by people in those those projects, but at the same time it makes things sometimes difficult to understand where they stand. Like for instance, I'm following Hearts of Woodin, but not not super thoroughly. Uh, I'm quite busy with other stuff, and for me in that example, it's it's a bit difficult to realize. Uh, at some point, it, it was released, but it's not released yet. You had a Kickstarter a year or two years ago. Where What's yeah, the, no, we, the status now? So one of the things we did was when when the Kickstarter started, I had a a packet with the core materials, uh, with the the basic rules, the moves, but also a set of the character keeper spreadsheets to to play from. 
and that's what we've updated over time. Uh, uh, I think like the last major change we've made to that was a few months ago where I added in some of the stretch goal settings and materials so that the, the people who back the Kickstarter could see those uh, for I think almost all of the uh, setting add-ons. Um, and so, so people who've been in the Kickstarter have had the, the versions has gone along. We've gotten some feedback on that. Not with the expectation that any of that is like publishable like stuff. But then last month, uh, finally, we got the final PDF edition of the core book. And that went out to people and we've got a few more corrections to do. And so that's gone out to backers and I believe the people who pre-ordered it. Uh, and then uh, uh, we're, we're gonna get that into the offset print version, which is slightly different. Uh, but I don't think we've got that up on drive through anything. I, I don't know since that's a decision being made on the publishing side, whether we're going to have that up and available before we get the hard, like the, the printed versions out to people. I'm, I'm, I'm of two minds on that. Um, but yeah. I am glad that it is out in a PDF version to backers. So, so the next step is the physical prints. Uh, I've heard uh, a few people using Kickstarter, not only the finance, uh, the printing of games for the people who purchase it, but also the some print runs so they have copies they can send to shops and sell at conventions uh, was that part also of that kickstarter are you do you have plans for running uh, more copies than has been already ordered i i'm going to be really terrible and say that that i don't know uh <laughs> i have here's the thing is one of the strengths of uh of this has been that there's a separate gauntlet publishing side that i'm really not part of except for being a writer for it and it's been really good to be able to hand those decisions like managing the royalties managing the kickstarter uh, build up and all of those decisions you know we have a contract like we, we split royalties and things like that but i i will admit uh, uh because it's not in my skill set i deliberately don't know <laughs> those things so that 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 that's sort of a, a abdicating responsibility but but I, I don't know. I'm. I think so. I think they're going to be copies for shops and and things. Uh, I certainly hope so. But uh, but I will say not probably not a huge number. Uh, you know the 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 economics of this in terms of selling to like Indie Press Revolution and uh, you know a few other distributors. That, that's still a pretty tight market. Uh, so you don't want to do a huge number of copies you know i used to work in academic publishing where you know we're like oh do we do we print 250 copies or is that too many or too little uh, of a book and i i think the scale is the same for a game from a not big company that isn't in a series that doesn't have you know a big established license or uh like fate uh, uh you know has has a, a big system behind it Oh, it's a big system. Too big, in my opinion. Well, PBTA, <laughs> uh, I, I disagree with you on that. No, I'm, jo uh, I'm joking, just for the uh, reference. Yeah, I, I know, I know. So, I know, so, I so know. people know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the success of fate. I was just joking about uh, today, there, were, there was a recent episode of The Gauntlet podcast on which I was on, and uh, I was talking about my experience with The Gauntlet this, as a system, and that, that I thought it was a bit too complicated for my taste and the way it was sold for me so, so that people know i think it's great faith is great it's great to kind of follow up now and it's interesting having having talked done that conversation with you last month uh, i've been been really th thinking about that and how how i enjoy fate what i dig about it and what i want to present and so for example uh i put uh i hunt or hashtag I hunt on the calendar for I think May. No, I need to runs. sign up for that. I'd really like to try that one. Uh, I'll probably be running it again. It's it's a, it's a really good good setting, and it's a fairly solid implementation of Fate. Uh, and then I'll be putting some other Fate games that I like on the schedule because we haven't had a lot of that, and we do have people uh, in the community that that play Fate and and. Uh, I, I enjoy it. I don't enjoy it 
as much as I enjoy running PBTA, because PBTA for me is, it really kind of runs itself. Fate requires a heavier hand from the GM. I tried recently, um, as part of a playtest, the Tales of Xadia uh, oh. Cortex Prime uh, game. And uh, I thought it was very elegant. Uh, hmm. I'm saying that because it sort of was doing what I expected Fate to do for me. Again, a question of expectations and the right. way it was sold to me. But it's sort of a nice, for me, sweet spot between something which is quite trad in the sense of uh, resolu action resolution focused compared to a PBTA which is more trope enforcement and narrative shaping uh, but in a way which I thought was very clean and elegant because you got a number of different things li like you do in Fates you got I don't know traits or situational traits or maybe stuff which are related to where and what you're doing uh, but they all have the same mechanical impact as far as i can tell they all result in a an additional dice in your pool being involved so uh you got your attribute that's one dice uh you've got your skill that's one dice you got a special trait from your background which says well you're a guard of the city and oh, if you use if it applies you got a one die for that and you got uh, special objects you might have in my case you have a special lens if i'm using my lens i got one other die but the question is always are those triggered and if they are the mechanical mechanical result is only that you have an extra die so they, they it's ve it seemed very clean to me and i was like oh actually that that reminded me of what oh i pictured fate again it's not a criticism it's interesting how sometimes you got expectations and it's not the reality of a thing which is uh, a source of discomfort is the mismatch between between what you were sold or what you were expected and your actual experience interesting uh uh, uh two things I, I do think a good deal of what you've just said is is applicable to fate but that's a that's a whole nother like yeah like, yeah that's a rabbit hole that we'll, we'll set aside but you know i've played cortex maybe eight or nine times now uh i think the last one i version i played was uh the leverage rpg and i will say i walk away from that game and i cannot remember the rules <laughs> like within within a minute of having walked away from the table i couldn't explain to anybody how to how to play that um and, and here's the thing it, it bugs me because like i've tried to read the hacker's guide to cortex and i bought the new edition and they and all of those things and they all look beautiful and i have all the leverage stuff and things but there's some barrier i have that i can't really grok cortex and it's too bad because people are loving it and yeah that now we've got this tales of zidia uh that's out there that uh you know is a is a neat thing and th that kind of bugs me there, there are like you like there are some systems that i've tried that i know people love and and they adore them and they just don't click for me i had the same experience with cypher system uh, I uh, spent a month running uh, three different versions of it, three different settings of Cypher on the gauntlet. I think I ran a dozen plus sessions trying to get a hold of why this game that powered Numenera and The Strange and all these things, why people loved it, and it didn't work for me. I'm quite curious how much Tales of Xadia, or at least the version I played because they called it the primer, and you can get those rules for free, I think. You can get the, the PDF, mm -hmm. and from what I was told by the person running it, it's a, it's a limited version of the rules. I'm quite curious how it differs from other Cortex and Cortex Prime games, because a bit like what you're describing, uh, Michael Ross from the RPG Academy He's got a show dedicated to Smallville, so Smallville the show, uh, mm -hmm. and because we is and <laughs> we knows a lot of his guests, including myself, are tabletop RPG fans. So one of the projects for the Patreon, you know, when you have a certain number of followers for this show, which is not about tabletop role playing games, is still to run a session of Smallville, the Cortex 
game. Uh, I, I believe it's Cortex. And Michael, who's yeah. a seasoned game master, who played with different systems, uh, including the Dungeons and Dragons and so on, uh, apparently he read it and he really struggled to understand how the system worked. And and that really surprised me with my experience of Tales of Xadia because it it was very straightforward. So it might be a case of it's a very accelerated version. Yeah, be- and keep in mind that Smallville and Supernatural and the early Firefly and those are very early Cortex games and have a lot heavier set of things going on. Uh, even Leverage uh, uh, has has a few like mechanical things that that seems to me a little bit like not intuitive when I played. Um, so I, I expect that the new version is probably much more more streamlined. And I, but I, and I think that that's necessary for something where you're going to want to to sell it to a broader public. I guess it's a bit of a case. That's not what they call, but uh, it's a bit like if we were comparing the very first edition of Dungeons and Dragons with D&D 4th or 5th edition, the, the things have evolved almost beyond recognition uh, between the, those versions. Um, the very different games with very different assumptions about what you're supposed to be doing at the table. Yeah, sometimes it's confusing when you have a an ecosystem of systems. Like, I interact a lot with the, the crew at Modifuse, and they got a whole range for using 2D20. You got the, the team of Free Alligan who's got their Mutant Year Zero system. But it's not like it's not like GURPS. You're not supposed to take your character from Tales from the Loop and play it in Aliens. Or you're not supposed to play your Star Trek uh, captain and suddenly it's compatible with your Conan the Barbarian uh, or Arkham Tulu character. They, they got the same core system, but they are really customized for for specific settings and experiences. Oh yeah, the, the the difference between say Forbidden Lands and and Mutineer Zero, and how Tales from the Loop approaches the same thing is 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 striking. I, the, and as you say, there's a massive difference in assumptions about what you are going to be doing in terms of resolution between Conan and say Dishonored right now. So uh, you mentioned your blog, Age of Ravens. Uh, mm-hmm. We won an any. That's uh, really impressive. And you, you also mentioned that you got a long-running RPG genre history series project. So, what is that about exactly? Is it about categorizing systems or settings? Uh, I saw a, a post you made recently about uh, games with licenses. So, what mm-hmm. is this project? Uh, so this started. Gosh, this must be seven or eight years ago at this point. And there had been a comment that I heard on and Robin's uh, game, uh, that, uh, their, their podcast yep. uh, from uh, Pelgrin. And they had talked about, well, X game was the first game that did this in the thing and really sparked the genre. And uh I, I, you know, I'm from started gaming in the mid seventies. So, you know, I, I was there and I worked in game shops in the early days. So I'm very cognizant of products that, that came out. And I was like, gee, I wonder if that's true. And uh, so I started looking at all the horror RPGs that had been put out. And I started creating a list that was broken down by several years uh, to to just say, well, here are the games that came out in this period. Uh, for for example, if I look at that first list of horror games, uh, we've got you know Call of Cthulhu is is the first that I can find, and then there's like uh, Stalking the Night, Fans, Ghostbusters, and Chill, and building up uh, a chronology of those games in each genre. Uh, and, and talking about each game for a little bit, uh, sometimes longer discussions, uh, uh, sometimes sh- shorter paragraphs, just mentioning what's going on in them, uh, sometimes an analysis, uh, sometimes my reaction to what the, the game is like. Uh, and that's it's a pretty hefty uh, series at this point. I've covered 
a horror. Uh, I've covered uh, superhero RPGs. Uh, I've covered cyberpunk RPGs. I've covered steampunk and Victoriana as one thing. Uh, Post-apocalyptic games, uh, universal RPGs. Uh, I've done a little bit with uh, Western slash Wild West games. Uh, 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 and the, the one I've been working through and then up to 2002 is all of the games that are built on licensed properties. Um, entries range anywhere from 2,000 words to, to 6,000 words on a particular entry. So it's, it's a pretty hefty uh, set of content that I've put together by this point. Have you ever run into a situation in which you had, because the, you know, the, the history, the chronology, uh, and I don't think things always fit as a, a, B, C, and D, things often happen in parallel, but uh, over the last year, I've become more and more aware that you've got almost this <laughs> uh, genesis of tabletop role playing game described as, and then... Uh, chain mail and then Dungeons and Dragons and from there mm -hmm. Tabletop RPG was born role playing was born uh, in a gam gamified uh, version but when you look in other genres which are somewhat parallel and cross with Tabletop role playing game like um, oh, I always forget how they're called in English um, fighting fantasy type of uh, mm -hmm. read your own adventure books or maybe epistolarian role playing, mm -hmm. you find cases which are older. So I think it's from the 1920s. There, there were a couple of ladies from the US who developed write your own adventures books already. Oh, yeah. And that, that that was a very hard choice that I had to make when we were kind of when I started working on this project. Is there are those things that, as you say, that the choose your own adventure and the fighting fantasy. Uh, you know, uh, 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 do do I, I add those in? And I opted not to just because of the volume of <laughs> things. And, and, you know, the same thing with, as we get into later years, I have to make a choice about which items we want to cover, uh, you know, how much of it, you know, uh, of the like very small electronic publications, you know, the dozen pages and things like that. And so there comes a point at which I went, okay, I'm going to only cover things that have a physical release or if they're in PDF electronic release, if they have, you know, a certain number of, of pages. And yeah, there's a ton of stuff that I have to leave out. But in the early days, you know, my, my, what I'm doing there is, is, uh, more of a kind of chronology general uh, than, than a historical uh, analysis. Like, as you say, there's, there's a bunch of, of people doing really interesting work in trying to analyze the roots, like uh, the, that Playing at the World book uh, by, I want to say Ossif, but I think I might be wrong, where he breaks down the history of D&D from a Kriegspiel um, yeah, that's uh, creek spiel and, is very interesting in the in that field. Yeah, uh, and then of course, designers and dragons, uh, the book by uh, uh, by Shannon Applegreen. Kind, I'm going to say that wrong. Uh, which which does like a more publisher analysis of of how the games go. You know, it's a thing. Is is uh, I call them histories of particular genres of RPGs, but I'm not a historian. Uh, I, I wish I were and could provide, uh, you know, had the rigor to provide a lot of the context for these things, because I know that there's there's a lot more. And, and, you know, there comes a point in which I'm like, I've already written, you know, 1500 words about this one game <laughs> on this list, I need to move on and and get to another one. That reminds me of a couple of my favorite podcasters who are dedicated to history, and it's it's always like that. As soon as they, they start pulling a thread, uh, there's a huge temptation to just... I mean, like, one of my favorite ones is Dan Carlin, and famously, he did a series dedicated to... Uh, uh, it's called Death Throes of the Republic, and it's about the fall of the Roman Republic. And but the the reason he made this six part series about that was he just wanted to do one about Cleopatra, 
And then he was like, well, if I talk about Cleopatra, I need to talk about Pompey and Julius Caesar. If I talk about Julius Caesar, I need to talk about this and that. And then you end up with uh, six time, uh, six episodes, each four hours long. Uh, that's uh, a huge amount uh, of things. Uh, I sort of skipped over traditional question, uh, which are uh, regarding the impact of COVID on your, your daily life. But... Uh, yourself and the gauntlet had a huge part in my life since COVID because it's since then that I, I discovered your community and by far the gauntlet is the, the people I've been playing the, the most with. Uh, but w what is the experience you as a the community manager of the gauntlet? Did you see a lot of growth? Did the, the type of game change in nature or frequency? So one of the things that's interesting is we had had uh, three, four years worth of uh, really organized online play experience before uh, uh, COVID hit. Uh, so, you know, bef before March of 2020, we had already built up uh, a large community. We'd built up the tools. We had our app for organizing games. And so it wasn't that hard for us to, to transition uh, uh, into that. And we had, we, had, we had spent a long time building up that knowledge. And one of the things that happened uh, very quickly once, once the COVID thing happened is us watching traditional face-to-face -face RPG groups online uh, start to panic. Uh, and start to to figure out. I mean, I had I was running, you know, uh, three or four online games a week, but I also had two face to face games that I had to make a decision: do we move them to online? Do we end them? And, and so on. And one of the things the community did at that point was some people started working on putting together just tools character sheets, guidelines, safety things, uh, you know, not, not necessarily building new safety things, but safety things that were existing, putting it all together for people so that we could ease the transition of people moving from face-to-face -to, -face to online. Uh, uh, Rich Rogers, for example, did a, a really nice blog post about, okay, you're playing a face-to-face D&D -face game now, and you want to transition to something online and maybe more indie here here's how we work through that and that was really solid and then the other thing that happened is that the, our community itself we started talking about okay how do we make it more accessible for new players uh you know how how do we establish tools and guidelines that when people come in we can very easily onboard them and get them into a game uh, which led to uh, the creation of a couple of programs. One is the, the Gauntlet Gameway program, where we set aside some of our priority RSVP signups for marginalized gamers, uh, uh, LGBTQ, uh, uh, women, uh, uh, gamers that might not be uh, as well served by traditional uh, uh, setups. And uh, also for those who are suffering financial hardship uh, to, to give them access to that. So that's one thing. And that's something the community said, hey, we need to do this. And then the community also said, we need to do an online convention that's just dedicated to bringing new people on, showing them how to play, showing them some of these new games. And that's where the, the Gauntlet Community Open Gaming came from. Like, like I, I helped shepherd it and kind of direct it, but it, it both of those things were very much the community saying, this is a need we have to serve and getting out there and serving it. Um, and and that's that's been great. Uh, I would say, I mean, we haven't had, we've had growth. Well, we say we've had dynamite growth uh, and I'm glad for that because I, I would like to see that growth not going necessarily to, to us all the time, but to other communities and other gaming conventions and things like that. Because uh, I think that, we benefit, all of us benefit when there are more communities of online gaming going on out there and hopefully increasing the diversity of the kinds of people that are playing them. 
Yeah, and I think there's something also which becomes very different as soon as there's a this critical mass of people playing online and communities, especially if they have each specific cultures and interests which are different. We uh, so you this episode the gauntlet I participated to. Uh, uh, we I was I brought up the subject of it. We don't have the language yet of explaining what type of game masters we are or, or we are looking for. But uh, I was thinking about that, re listening for the first time to the episode today and remembering our conversation, and it reminded me of the conversation I had elsewhere. It's something new to have a luxury to be able to pick game masters or pick players. So. A lot often I discuss with people. I try to encourage them to be curious to try different games, but the answer is, "Oh, my group is not into that," or oh, "I don't have a game master who does that in my area." And even living in London, uh, having several gaming clubs here, I didn't have the luxury before COVID. Uh, it was probably there, but uh, I did not tapped into it yet of like the gauntlet and other communities being able to say okay i heard of this game i heard of hearts of wooden on a podcast i'd like to try it and then i show up and i can find a game to join there so so now now i'm i'm, I'm becoming pickish and i want to be able to say okay well are you running that exactly and you know make my choices but until COVID, to some extent there was not it was not a practice to curate your table and be able to to play whatever game you want to get to play because they are available. Yeah, there there are a couple of dimensions to that. One is that, as you say, that just having a, a, enough people out there that we're getting a bunch of different games. Uh, another thing has been setting up, at least in, is as you know, in our community on our our Slack channel. A, a a channel that people can just come and say this is a game i'd like to play i've heard about is anybody running it um and if somebody's running it can you save me a, a seat in it and so that's gone a long way to having helping people be comfortable and trying out these new games but i think one of the other really exciting things to me is that we do have this open table policy uh, so, like, essentially, anybody can sign up for a game. Uh, in, in most cases, with a few exceptions, you can just sign up for one game, try it out. And if it's not your bag, you can go in and play something else. And that's allowed us to reach more people. And it's also been a process where as we as GMs have had to learn and adapt to that, have had to change how we approach things to be able to provide drop-in players and drop-out players. Um, and I think it's, it's a challenge, but it's also something that uh, is a, real, a really strong learning experience for, for GMs. It's, it's really, um, what's the expression? You know, it lifts a weight from, your, from one shoulder and uh, recently had to cancel several games because of uh, health issues and availability issues. And it was nice that because I played several games at the Gauntlet, I knew that that was really not something I, I should add to my worries about, mm -hmm. oh, I'm letting down my group and so on. Uh, or or are, they gonna, are they gonna be upset that I leave the table because uh, I cannot? Uh, it's something which comes across as absolutely normal. It's not. It doesn't mean as a result that you have people leaving tables without reason uh, all the time. I don't see that happening. Uh, but one thing I, I I often point out when I try to bring people to the gauntlet, uh, thanks to that, I guess, but I, also because of the culture uh, of the gauntlet, people should really reply to games which are fully booked especially if there are new players, because I see, in my experience, you make room for new players when you see them in the waiting list, or just the circumstances make yeah. it so that often when you're in the waiting list, you're going to end up in the game. Not always, but often. There, There's a large percentage of games that uh, by the time that the game series starts, 
the the wait list people have moved up from there to the actual playlist and that's great that that means that that people have checked their schedule they they've assessed what they can do and and have have opted to you know uh, let others have those uh, that space um you know and our, our our app is set up to to manage that um and yeah i i, I think it's like Last time we ran the data, it was like 30% of games take from the wait list to, to, towards the end. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's been great to me to see the community step up when somebody says, gee, I'm a new player. I'm having a hard time getting into sessions. I'd really like to play this. Uh, and then we, we get, them, get them into that. Um, you know, and then here's the thing is uh, we have a lot of GMs. All our GMs, of course, are voluntary. These are, these are people who are volunteers who are, are running these games because they like to run and they're running different things uh, and they're responsive to what the players need, um, to what, what's exciting and hot, uh, which changes, you know, we used to have a lot of Dungeon World on the Gauntlet calendar, but over time, you know, that has changed. Uh, but this, this is about these, these GMs deciding to do this for themselves like and and really supporting the community and and that's great um that that there's that kind of excitement to it um and it, it's great for the fact that one of the things is that uh people who want to run for us uh, we ask them to play with us first uh play in a few sessions so that they see what our play culture is like so that they see how we structure safety tools, so that we see how we structure uh, sessions, how we structure feedback at the end. I think that's really important because we actually had some people that have come in and been very excited and have played with us and said, oh, I'm more comfortable with a very trad game or I'm more comfortable with a more structured game. Uh, and, and, and we've given them that chance, that chance to see if this is something they want, you know, and to, to know how we manage table talk, how we manage play culture, things like that to, to learn that. And I think that having that freedom to jump in and, oh, this isn't for me being able to say politely step out, uh, we've got a real good play culture of communication. Um, the only time I kind of follow up on people and, and like try to try to push on people is when people don't communicate with their GMs or 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 don't show up or things like that. That that's the the only times we have any any really strong friction in the system. I think. But what I find also fascinating is how not only you've got a pool of volunteer game masters, but a lot of those game masters are designers, fine tuning their games or promoting their games. I mean that that was my motivation to be honest when I joined the Gauntlet. I wanted to test and promote uh, the, the my first game that I'm developing, but. Uh, I find it fascinating to see even people, I don't think they've been running games, but I remember Ian Cooper from Chaosium posting on the forum for opinions on rules that they were developing or fine tuning for the next uh, Glorenta HeroQuest. Uh, a lot of the games I played often were with people who were the designers of those games and sometimes they several months later a version of those would turn up on each uh, and so on and there's also a big culture of hacking games which i find really fascinating so yeah what, what's uh are, are you involved as well in the that aspect of the the community yeah. i, I want to say this is like there are a lot of people that play that are gms that have played and have ideas for games and uh, maybe they they would or wouldn't take it to their face-to-face -face group because that maybe okay we only meet every two weeks and we meet in person I don't necessarily want to want to put them through, through that um, to try things out we've developed a strong culture to tell the GMs hey if you've got an idea and you want to try out a game try it out tell people in the description hey this is a thing I wrote I, I'm we're um, I'm kind of playing it out to see how it works and we've got a lot of players who are like, yeah, I've played with you as a GM. You're a great GM. I'm going to try your game. Uh, Hearts of Wulin started as that, is I had wanted to do something that simulated 
uh, Wuxia, a TV series like The Untamed, uh, and uh, A Proud Smiling Wanderer, and uh, Laughing in the Wind, and those kinds of things. And so I, I kind of wrote this up over time, and I said, hey, I'm going to try this, and people tried it and liked it. Um, you know, and I've hacked a, a bunch of different existing games to slightly other, other systems to make them work for me. You know, on the most recent podcast I did with you, I talked about uh, hacking Knights Black Agents a little bit to make it fit with how I did things. Uh, I've done the same thing with Changing the Lost, which I, I adore. I think that's a, just a dynamite setting. Uh, but, I, you know, to make that a PBTA game in, in a way that I enjoy, and, it, and I've, I've done it, and it's a glorious mess. Um, <laughs> and, and, and a bunch of other things. Some of the things work. Some of the things don't. Like I, I did a, a 7th C hack with D6, uh, sort of the D6 system that from Star Wars, and it was okay. Wasn't great. I, I might go back to it at some point, but it's it's an experiment. And I'm, I love that people on the gauntlet are willing to, A, take that step and, and, and try those things out. Uh, at, you know, to put them out there because that's a that's a real risk. Ooh, you know, I don't, I built this. Is are people going to enjoy it? Uh, and are people going to lambast me in the the, the end comments? Uh, and then at the same time, players being willing to to try it out and give solid feedback. And we and we've been blessed with a, a, a number of really exciting designers. I think Alan Rees has been doing very cool. Uh, things uh, uh, across the the board. Uh, we've had we've had a number of designers that have been with us for a while and have moved on to uh, doing other other things, building their own discords and things. And I think that's great. Uh, for a long time, we had uh, uh, the the people who wrote um, a Good Society. They they ran a bunch of things for us and tried out some new games. And and when uh, when G Plus shut down, they kind of moved into. Uh, their own thing. And I think that's, that's dynamite. Uh, and of course, the co-host of the Gauntlet podcast is uh, Jamila uh, Najati. And they are, they are brilliant. Uh, and they came to us because I had seen their, their game on itch.io and I loved it. And I, I kind of boosted it. And then they came and ran at one of our gauntlet cons a few years ago, and then they came back and they've been able to, to play and play test a lot of things. And some of that stuff, uh, like the announcement last week that Apocalypse Keys, Jamila's Apocalypse Keys is being done by Evil Hat. And that's something that uh, literally they were like, oh, I really want to do this. And they started play testing it with the community. Uh, to, to build the basis that they could then take and go and and showcase to other places. And it's it's so good. Uh, and here's the other thing is, if if you've got a great game and you've done this and people play it, people will say, hey, can I now run it for other people? Like uh, Alexi Sargent uh, of Cloven Pine Games. Uh, I know that his game, Plutonian Shores, that he's working on, he ran it. People really liked it. And now other people are running it. Uh, and the same thing with his uh, Checkpoint Midnight game. And that's that's great. It's great to have the community supporting each other's designs. Yeah, and it's very contagious, you know, when you start being exposed to that and you, you join a game and you're told, oh, I'm running this game, it's by Alexis. So uh, Alan ran uh, Checkpoint Midnight for me and a couple of others. So at the end, you had to ask you for the feedback for Alexi and you try this game and you can see it's in progress. It's yeah, it's very contagious in the sense that you, well, I'd like to try something like that. You know, I love Nephilim, but the system, it's a bit old, it's BRP, I think it's not supporting the tone as much. So very quickly, you start having your own ideas and an appetite to, to do it. And I must say, it's very interesting also how your podcast, the Gauntlet podcast, offers a snippet of that. I really like how it's structured always with two or three or, or from the community and talking about the experience of a game because there's a lot of shows which debate different topics. There's a lot of shows on which designers show up to plug their, their, 
their game, to tell about their own game, what they want to do, and please go subscribe to my Kickstarter and so on. There's a lot of actual play games, but I don't know that many shows in which you got players sitting down and saying, I tried that, and this bit I really liked, and this bit I didn't like as much, but this was very unique, and oh, I cannot wait to try this thing. It's it's very special, and I really like the type of content and feedback it offers about uh, the act of playing and the act of designing a game. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's for me the one thing I've loved, and the thing that we've tried to focus on with the the Gauntlet podcast is is play. That you play things and you talk about how they work at the table what you like about them that 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 yeah you can read through a game and you can give those impressions of a game but you really only know what a game is doing when you have a chance to try it at the table uh and and see how that works and and i i i kind of uh adore that uh because i, I like to play and you know one of the things is I, I've, I, for a long time, I got in the loop of, I'm just a GM. I've got to keep running, you know, blah, 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 blah. And at a certain point last year during the, the COVID thing, I, I could see that I was burning myself out. And rather than running three different games a week on the gauntlet, I, I cut it down to two. And I was like, I'm going to play more. And that, that really opened things up. I've tried some things. I've learned new GMing techniques. I've seen games that I might not have otherwise played, like Fate of Cthulhu. That's not something I necessarily would have gone to run. Um, you know, I'm playing Last Fleet now by, by oh, Josh nice. uh, Fox. Um, and, and that's been an interesting one because I'm enjoying that experience, but I also realized that that maybe not is not the game for me. Like the tone... Uh, and and all the military stuff in it is maybe not what I want. I, I, I will I will come out of the other side of that, having learned a lot and having enjoyed my time. But overall, uh, you know, recognizing that you know some games are good, but maybe maybe the feel of them isn't isn't what I want. But I'm playing with people that I like, and I'm comfortable with, so I'm willing to go through that experience because just playing with them is is great. Um, and I, I think that's, I know a lot of people who are super GMs, uh, who, you know, oh, I just want a GM and things like that. And, and that's, that's great, but I think you need to play too. I think, I think you've got to, uh, uh, it, it, it broadens your, your horizons. It, and it shows you what games look like at the table, um, I sometimes hit games that I read through the rules. I read what elements they put in there. And I'm, I'm like, you haven't considered how this rule book is going to get used by how these reference sheets are going to actually get used by players, how, how easy it is to, to get at things. Uh, and this is not to knock blades in the dark, but I'm about to knock blades in the dark. <laughs> um, I, I love blades in the dark. Like, I love the Forge in the Dark stuff. It's it, and I think Blades in the Dark, that core book is, for me at least, it's a great teaching book. Like when I read through that and go from place to place in that, I'm like, ah, I get this part. I get this part. And it, it slowly builds up. Like it feels like a really good textbook. I think Blades in the Dark is ass when it comes to the table to try and figure out where where reference points are. Um, I, and I ran three years of blades in the dark and still every time i had to look up particular things i could never find it because the organization was based more on teaching than it was on obvious here's where the sections are and these are clearly marked out and things um and that's something that you learn only from from play and from having those things you know uh to to look through I think uh, I don't remember who it was. Uh, this, this. Ah, it's probably Lloyd again, uh, because we were saying it's that always it, Lloyd. <laughs> it's always Lloyd. <laughs> that uh, as a hobby, it was quite difficult to access. Uh, but to some extent, I think it's um, 
it's almost as much a feat as a fault of the tabletop role playing hobby because you it's a hobby which needs to be social it's very difficult to learn it and practice it on your own or even just with your little group sure that that used to be the way for a lot of people but it's it's a tremendous amount of effort so as soon as you and nowadays it's much easier to find people the best way to learn it is to do it with other people and i say that as someone i am i i'm getting worse and worse and worse at reading a, a, any book of role playing game i'm terrible at that a, I'm terrible at reading them. I'm very slow at reading them if they are not really concise, not simple, but very focused on what they're doing and limited in scope. Uh, I lose track immediately. And second, when I try to apply what I read, I had that especially with PBTA, I read it and I'm like, yes, yes, that makes sense. I even read books by French authors which are about, how oh, do you run this PBTA game strictly? And I read that, I'm like, yes, it makes sense. And then I'm at the table trying to game master it. I'm like, I'm completely lost. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. So it's very important for me to be able to sit down at a table as a player. At this point, I accepted it. And I'm like, if anyone wants to sell me a Kickstarter a game, they will have to put me at the table with someone who's running their game. Uh, because I I won't buy something anymore which I'm reading, even because even if I'm f love the concept, even love, and I manage to read front to back the book, I won't be able to run it. I just can't. I really need to play it first, and then I will run what I remember out of it, and maybe double check some things uh, now and then. I'll say two things on that. One is the default assumption for all games when people put them on the calendar and, and i think this is another really important part of what we do is the gm is going to teach you the rules you don't yes. have to have the books you don't have to know the rules the gm is going to teach you what you need to know and you know we encourage to say to gms you need to do that which also means the gms you need to know what you need to teach which means stripping down the system to the most basic things and 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 knowing that and and we've had really good success with that of GMs working and, and teaching games. But the other thing I've seen that has been something that I've, I've figured out and that a lot of the other GMs have figured out is one of the best ways to figure out a game, you know, to, is to skim the rules. For me, it's okay, where's the resolution system? Where's the character sheet? You know, and then I go to everything else, but is to build an online character keeper. Yeah. Like, at, because you go, okay, what do the players need to see? What, what do they need to know? What is the minimum amount of information they need to have? What, what quick rules do I need to put in here? How do I make this easy? And that is how I, that's been my process for learning new games over the last year and a half, two years is. If I'm like, okay, I'm not sure exactly what's going on here. Let me stop. Let me read through it and let me build a, a, a character keeper spreadsheet, take somebody's template and and tweak it and see how I can get that. You know, that's that's part of what allowed me to finally uh, make some changes and get Star Trek Adventures to work for me. Uh, uh, Nibiru uh, is another one that I've been working on a character keeper for because when I read through the rules, I, I still wasn't sure about what was happening in it and and doing that process has has made it easier for me to go oh i net this is how this is going to change this is how i have to to show it to the players um and here are the the, the basic rules that i need to do i was so annoyed recently i joined the stream of uh pope tulu and i i talked briefly about that on the slack of the gauntlet i had to create just my character in pope tulu and i was so frustrated that there was no character keeper to the standards of the gauntlet i was like i'm so annoyed trying to create this character i just want to to click drop downs and select my options and then have stuff put in place so since then i found out you can do it through the foundry apparently but it's still it's still way more complicated than uh, the sort of tools which are which are listed and people can find them i'll probably put a link to them 
uh, on the online resources of the gauntlet you got uh, that that's the first place when i went actually i was <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I posted on Slack, is there a Pope Tulu <laughs> character keeper at the gauntlet? And no, there isn't because uh, PRP is a bit boring. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, the, you know, the, there's also another aspect of culture. I was a bit shocked. I guess I was lucky that when I started role playing games, it was not expected from players. Actually, it was forbidden to some extent for players to buy the core book of whatever game you really? we were playing. Yeah, yeah, it was sort of the deal that... But I think it was a good rule. Uh, not, you know, not completely, uh, not the question of trust, but the rule was if we were three game masters, we could not run the same games because uh, I guess it came from a trust issue, which was bad. Which was... <laughs> you, were not say, su- yeah. <laughs> you were not supposed to know the secrets from this or that game but the the good side effect what it was that it encouraged a diversity of games being played and i know some games i played like nephilim i played it because the f- brother of my game master bought another game they wanted to run and they were okay what am i running then and they, they picked up nephilim and once they picked up nephilim their older brother could not pick Nephilim had to play it. So it enforced that among three wow. game masters, uh, it sort of changed over time. But that's, te- that's wild to me. But technically it made that you had three game masters in that group of, uh, I don't know, half a dozen people. Uh, you will never end up with the situation of the three game masters all running Dungeons & Dragons. Because one game master was the Dungeons and Dragons game master, and the other was an FLM one, and the third one was the Vampire the Masquerade one, and uh, maybe there could be arguments whether Werewolf was part of Vampire the Masquerade, and you could because the lore and uh, yada yada yada. But the result was that you would play different games, and because of that, as the player, you were not expected to know the rules religiously before showing up at the table, but. Flash forward to a couple of years ago here in London, and I'm running at a club, a Star Wars D6, at a club where they play a lot of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. And I was shocked by the number of my players who signed up for the game who asked me, okay, so uh, what are the rules? I was like, you don't worry about that. You show up, it's Star Wars D6, it's simple, don't worry. No, 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 no. Uh, where can I find the player's handbook? Because they were in that mindset, this yeah. ecosystem of Dungeons and Dragons, that there's so much system mastery, which is part of your enjoyment, even as a player, that you need it. You will impair your enjoyment and you will impair the enjoyment of other people at the table if you do not master the system. So so it's kind of helpful when you show up at the gunnet, you're like, no, 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 you don't need to know Spire, you just show up. Leandro will explain to you. Oops, oh, we had a problem. Oh, had a little problem with the zoom. Hmm, I'm gonna try to restore that. Uh, oops. Okay, I'm gonna try to have uh, uh, the zoom back up. Can I invite someone? Okay. There you are. 
Okay, that's all my thoughts. Uh, <coughs> some no scheduling issue with the RPG Academy, uh, which lends me their Zoom meeting. So you're on my Zoom, uh, but there's some kind of limitations. But uh, that's it. Uh, so yeah, I was saying, people were really stressed about having to know the rules in advance, which uh, it's not the case with the gauntlet. Uh, well, and here's the thing is, I would say that in the 80s and 90s for... You know, we played Champions and GURPS and uh, a World of Darkness and uh, all of those things. And yeah, everybody bought the rules. Everybody had had it. It was a very different thing. Like everybody bought copies of it. Only one person was ever running, but everybody had all the, the reference materials. And uh, I'd say the change happened like right around the 2000s that in micro people were like i don't want to buy any more things just you know lol just just run this game tell us what we need to know um you know and so th there was a change we started playing like fate and house systems and uh hacks of storyteller and uh blades in the dark and and those things and the players are like just tell us give us reference sheets and tell us what we need to know um and and that was a real change and and so i was glad to see that also on the gauntlet i remember uh, the yeah, these these days i'll tell you i'm not sure i want to run any game that uh, uh like can't be run without the players having a copy like pathfinder or, or something like that like to to really do those games just as the players need to have their reference materials and have all their character stuff and things um and and know the mechanics of it and i'm not sure i could could run that yeah no well i i presume but i think i know you like me uh it's not it's not a judgment of the qualities of those games it's no it's a question of taste or availability uh to run those types of games yeah and, and i like my like a face-to-face -face local group which probably total amongst the various games is probably about a dozen plus people uh you know and they come and play in our our action cards which is our card based fate hack or they come and play uh blades but then there's another group they're playing pathfinder they've got six seven people at the table they're playing pathfinder they have a guy who who, who plays in all my other games but uh you know he's the crunchy guy and you know he's spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on miniatures and f figures and things like that, uh, and and that's that's the experience that he gives. Yeah, my my only criticism of those type of systems is that I find they tend to be ecosystems which, to some extent, are built to keep people inside, and people tend to have the expectation that other systems might be as complicated. So. Uh, in an ideal world, uh, I would encourage people have breaks and play little games as well. I mean, it's like, yeah. I don't know, you could play poker and be excellent at poker and still play a game of, mon you know, even the M word, Monopoly, you know, and then or set at least Settlers of Catan uh, without expecting that uh, you are available just for a single game and you need to play it all the time and... Uh, if you try to learn any other game, it will be as demanding uh, as the one you're playing at the moment. Well, and that in order to get the most experience, the, the, if you want to get everything out of the table, if you want to, you need to know the system, that, that, that there's a culture of, of system mastery and uh, you know, expectations that other players know their roles and know how the system works. And, and the only way this works is if everybody knows what they're doing. You know, I've, I've, my friend who runs Pathfinder, he plays in, like when he goes to a convention, he plays in every like shared world Pathfinder game. And, you know, there's expectations and he gets frustrated if there's some players who don't know the rules and they mm. don't know how to run their character. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, dude, 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 you know, and I've played in those games where I'm the guy who has no freaking idea <laughs> what 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 is the best thing to do, um, and 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 I I don't dig that. Yeah, 
I would have issues as soon as character creation with those sort of game because oh yeah so then I want to create a gnome and I take this power and this feat and then people say you don't want to do that that's a yeah, terrible yeah. combo <laughs> and I'm like it's, a, it's oh, really no. inefficient <laughs> but your I'm, damage per second uh, is going to be really low uh, <laughs> boy even MMORPGs that would show up with a troll who was a shaman and people would be like that's that's terrible they got very bad I, charisma I, years of running a troll shaman in uh, <laughs> everquest so i have i have no 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 qualms about that but yeah yeah i uh, what it thinks is if you give up this this if this you detach from the desire to master a system that allows you to be willing to go and dabble and try other things. You broaden your horizons when you detach, you give up on that attachment and allow, allow a greater breadth of experience. And at the same time, I'm, I'm a, I'm a grumpy old man because at the same time as oh yeah I, you definitely I, are I, I'm as I'm as upset by people who are like oh, I played this but we we just ignore the system we we do all these crazy things uh, in this game and you're like but you're ignoring the game <laughs> you could use another game to do that it would be so much better for everyone no no like, well, rules don't matter uh, rules of cool everything and I'm like ah okay rules of cool but yeah maybe try another system <laughs> see i i i can i can get that but i'm okay with those changes if people are very clear about them it's it's when you get surprised by something that that okay you know i've i've assumed that this is how the game is working and then you've changed some core facet or you're ignoring this thing that that the choices that i've made are built on um you know that's where i get grumpy but otherwise okay whatever you want to do I had that with yeah. a game. Uh, I won't yeah. name the game. It's a classic game. It's the most played game. Okay, so people know what this game is. Uh, <laughs> uh, someone had the classic idea of saying, "Oh yeah, but I'd like it to be grittier." So I'm gonna I'm gonna remove the uh, I don't even remember what they called uh, the daily rest or the weekly rest. You you <laughs> cannot do you cannot do a short rest. Huh. And I was interesting. <laughs> I wonder what this game would be. Yeah, what this huh. game might be. And I was playing. Uh, it happened to be one of those games with a class called a monk. And uh, I was like, "Oh, you you play? Oh, I play a monk, but there's no short rest anymore because it's grittier." And I was like, "Actually, you just destroyed what I can do because I do three things, and then I can punch things." <laughs> I don't have powers anymore. Yeah. So thank you very much. My character is going to go there and sleep <laughs> for eight hours. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've hit that sometimes where, like, I love 13th Age. 13th Age is my, if, you're gonna, if we're going to play that kind of trad D&D feel game, I, I, 13th Age is what I'm going to play. Um, and, but my general thing has been to, they have icon roles as a system, and I don't usually do it in general. I haven't done it at the start of each session, but now we've got a character. Uh, one of the players ha has a, uh, a thing that's keyed on the, the icon role. So, okay. Yeah. Change my style to match it. If I don't want to uh, uh, short change a player uh, just because I want to kind of uh, get through something fast, but, uh, but I try to be flexible. Yeah. It's, it's funny because actually, I played another monk in 13 age and I sort of had the opposite situation because okay I was presented with all those rules and it was a bit much oh, just yeah. for a one shot that is the rules heaviest but it uh, looked cool classes. you know it looked cool it was like okay I'm in for that uh, tactical but it could be nice but it came across to me that okay the game master was doing theater of the mind okay fine but all the powers of my monks were related to giving free movements or having free movements and being able to be, I don't know, long distance and coming melee range to his thing and then end up in range weapon uh, range uh, again. But because rule of cool and all of that was theater of the mind, it was another case of, okay, 90% of my powers are I use less <laughs> because they do stuff which we do not include in the session today because we we say okay rule of cool we're not too fussy about are you at melee or range attack but then it was 
Yeah, but then then that system specifically is not working, or at least not that class. It, it's it's where having even the, the the smallest debrief at the end of a session, you know, in a gauntlet, generally the fallback is stars and wishes. Stars being at the end of the session, tell us something you enjoyed or or dug, and wishes being things you'd like to see more of or things you want to change, things like that. It's it's we're having a culture where the GM is willing to listen to that feedback and go, oh, the way I'm handling this is shortchanging your character. Do you as a player want to change? If you don't want to want to make that change, you know, how should I change it? You know, and and, and being a GM is being flexible. Um which is hard. It is hard as a GM to, to learn to listen to that kind of feedback at the end and, and integrate that. I was, I was terrified of doing that uh, <laughs> four or five years ago when I first started. I didn't want to do that. Rich Rogers did that every session. I was like, screw that. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but it's maybe a better GM. Um, and you have to, it's great that we have players that are willing to say, hey, this isn't working for me for this reason. Um, is there something we can do about that? Uh, you know, I think there's on, on both sides, there's the GM being, being willing to take feedback and players not being afraid to say, Hey, this is, this is, uh, this is not working for me. How, how can we, can well, can we get this to work for me? Or can we see more of this in the game? I really like this, or it fits with my character. I'd like to, to emphasize that. And that conversation and negotiation, I think, is is so important. You know, a lot of people don't like to talk about the meta, like we don't we want to stay in the game, but but I, I think you have to talk about that meta level and, and uh, staging it as a constant thing you do at the end of the session. It reassures players that okay, I'm going to get through the, the session, but I'm going to have a chance to say at the end, you know, if there was something that didn't quite click for me. Yeah, and again, it's one of those things, it's a culture, it's not, because mm -hmm. I could, you know, before being at the gauntlet and it applied to safety tools, the X cards and, and the wishes and so on, these are the sort of stuff, the sort of advice I would hear on the podcast, and then you show up at your regular table and you're like, hey, hey folks, uh, we're going to do wishes and tones and stars and at the end of the session, and, and people are like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't like that. So, what, did you enjoy the game? What was your least liked moment in the game? And people are like, oh, I don't know. It was fine. And they, they, they shy. You, you're shy as a game master a bit to ask the question, and they can tell. And they shy to express that because they're not mm -hmm. sure about it. But if you show up at a game at a club or the gauntlet where it's common practice, you just the newcomer, and you just see the other people doing it around you, and it's easy you into doing it uh how it's done and so on because uh yeah we yeah we tend to to read and express a lot of advice or a number of things which are good advice but they're not as easy to apply as you read it and you, you do it at your table yeah i i, I think parallel to that one of the things that gms have to get used to too is it, especially in that structure is giving permission to players to just say hey i don't have anything or or I, I, you know, come back to me, um, because sometimes when you when you do that thing, you like want to get feedback, you want to get impressions, but some players that's not their that's not their bag. If it isn't, okay, cool, uh, you know, give them a thumbs up for for saying that they didn't want to, or or don't have anything we want to say, and move on. Great. Well, moving on uh, on that, uh, we way past the one hour mark. Uh, did we forget something you wanted to plug today? Uh, no, I guess I would say, um, and of course you probably have the link to this, uh, the, the gauntlet is this online gaming community, uh, and we have a hundred plus sessions on the calendar. We've got people from all kinds of time zones, Europe, uh, all across the U S we've got a, a number of, uh, Southeast Asian Australian players now. Uh, and you can find out more about that at gauntlet-rpg.com. Uh, if you go there, you can see our blog, uh, which we, we do uh, have, a, have a big backlog of posts. We have our full podcast network there. Uh, we have links to a ton of online play resources that are free 
uh, at the site. So it's it's a really good place to go and 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 check out. Definitely, yeah. And I I will include links to all of that in the the description on YouTube, or if you're listening to this only in audio in the description of the episode, just click there. And uh, you will find your way to the gauntlet, and hopefully we will be playing together very soon. My voice is a mess. Oh yeah, it's going, boy. Oh wow! Uh, thank you so much for joining, Lowell. And uh, well, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll play again uh, very soon together. Great, thank you. Cheers, bye everyone, and thanks to the people in the the chat room. We had a lot of people today. Bye, bye, bye. -bye.